Hello and welcome to part two of this endocrine revision series for the Crash Course Medicine. Today we're going to be looking at some of the specific endocrine organs, including the thyroid and parathyroid glands, the adrenal glands and the pancreas, and then we'll link that into obesity and diabetes in order to give it a little bit of a clinical context. Of course, in the last video we looked particularly at the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, and in the next video we're going to continue looking at some other endocrine organs. But for now, let's just focus in on these three here. So let's start with a thyroid, which is of course is a butterfly-shaped gland, and it's got two lobes on either side, which is separated by a central isthmus, which essentially is the narrow passage between the two pieces of tissue. In terms of embryology, it's actually really important for the thyroid, because it's actually a downgrowth from the tongue. It migrates inferiorly from the thyroglossal duct, which is a posterior aspect of the tongue near the valate papillae. And histology actually is really important as well, because it's made up of cuboidal epithelium. And it's also made up of calcitonin producing C cells. So if you looked at the histology of a thyroid gland, it's actually really easy to differentiate these. In terms of the anatomy of it, you've got you can see the two lobes here, and you can see the separating isthmus in the middle. It's also important to take note of the vasculature which exists around this area. With regards to the fact you've got this common carotid artery running up here and bifurcating into the internal and external carotid arteries. You can also see the thyroid cartilage, and it's also important to note that the thyroid gland does not sit on top of the thyroid cartilage, but actually below it. In terms of other anatomical um, marks around here, of course, this is your trachea, which goes down towards your lungs where it bifurcates. And then up above, you've got this thyrohyoid uh, membrane in between the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone. And then, of course, at the back here, you've got the epiglottis. It's also important to be aware that the calcitonin, which is produced by the C cells, decreases the amount of calcium in the body. And it does this when we have increased calcium, it produces the calcitonin, which then leads to a decrease. It's almost like a negative feedback mechanism, as are a lot of things in the endocrine system. But this will be covered in part three of the video in quite a lot of detail. So the thyroid, it produces the hormones T3 and T4. So a little question here, what does the thyroid gland produce more of? Is it T3 or T4? The answer is T4, and it actually produces T4 to T3 in a 20 to 1 ratio, so it produces a heck of a lot more T4 than T3. However, T3 is the active, useful product that our body needs, and therefore within the body, when it's released, T4 needs to be converted to T3. So how are thyroid hormones synthesized? It's quite a complicated um, system, but if you put it step by step, it's really not too bad. So first of all, we have an active uptake and concentration of iodide from our diet. Then when this iodide's been concentrated, it diffuses into the lumina by passive diffusion. We then have this half equation where we can see iodide becoming two iodine molecules. Next, we see the iodination of tyrosine. And remember, tyrosine is one of those 20 standard amino acids that our bodies use in order to synthesize proteins. So then we can look at this, and I'm going to pop all these up at once, because you can either have I plus MIT, so this is monoiodotyrosine, and this forms DIT, so diiodotyrosine. So the simple way to think about this is you can either have MIT or DIT, and MIT is when you've got one iodine bound to tyrosine, or you can have DIT, where you've got two iodines bound to tyrosine. So if you add a MIT and a DIT together, you get T3, in other words, you've got three iodine molecules per tyrosine. If you had a DIT and a DIT together, you get T4. So you have four iodine molecules. So this makes sense that when you release these from the thyroid, actually you release a lot more T4, but you want to turn it into T3. So it needs to undergo a deiodinization reaction in order to remove an iodine from the T4 to form T3. So next we have the parathyroid glands, which are four small glands on the back of the thyroid. And not everyone has these. Some people will have two, some people will have four. And they're usually paired, however, so one here, one here, one here, and one here. And their arterial supply is usually from the inferior thyroid artery. They're made up of parenchymal and chief cells, which differ in function. So the parenchymal, cell, parenchymal cells were not particularly sure of their function. However, chief cells particularly secrete PTH. And PTH does pretty much the opposite of what calcitonin does, as we discussed before. So it's all about negative feedback, and it's all about calcium levels, and we'll discuss this in proper detail in the next um, video. However, just as a brief description, if you have a low level of calcium, you want to release PTH, because therefore it's going to increase the calcium through these mechanisms here. Again, we'll discuss this later on. Likewise, if you've got too much calcium, you want to release calcitonin from the thyroid, 
in order to do the opposite process, i.e. reduce the calcium levels. Next we have the adrenal glands. So these are the glands that sit on top of your kidneys. They're bilateral, so they occur on both sides of the body on top of both kidneys, and they're divided into a cortex and a medulla. And an easy way to think about this is the cortex is divided into GFR. So you can put this into context in the respect when you're thinking about the kidneys, you have a GFR, a glomerular filtrate rate. But this is the adrenal glands, they sit on top of the kidneys, and the cortex can be divided into GF and R, in other words, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticulares. And a lot of people remember this as salt, sugar, sex. So the zona glomerulosa produces salt, in other words, mineralocorticoids. The zona fasciculata produces sugar, in other words, glucocorticoids. And the zona reticularis produces sex, in other words, androgens. Then you have a medulla, which produces catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, or adrenaline and noradrenaline. To have a look at those in a little bit more detail, your zona glomerulosa, an example of a mineralocorticoid, an example of a salt, is aldosterone. An example of a zona fasciculata glucocorticoid is cortisol, or corticosteroid. And then you have zona reticulares, which produce androgens such as dehydro, um, epiandrosterone, um, in other words, the stimulation of masculinization. And the adrenal medulla, as we've already said, that's epinephrine, norepinephrine, so these stimulate the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. In terms of a blood supply to the adrenal glands, they have a triple blood supply, so from the superior, middle, and inferior uh, suprarenal arteries. And you can see these here. So the superior suprarenal arteries are dividing off here. Your middle suprarenal artery is here. And your inferior suprarenal artery is here. And you can see these all come from different origins. So the inferior suprarenal artery coming down from this splenic artery here. You've got middle suprarenal super artery, which is coming directly off of the aorta by the looks of it. And then you've got this superior suprarenal artery, which is coming off of this branch of the aorta here. Moving on, we can look at the pancreas. So the pancreas is an interesting or organ because it can be endocrine or exocrine. Now we cover the exocrine function in the GI block. So in terms of endocrine function, it has three cells that have note, the alpha, beta, and delta cells. The pancreas is located anatomically behind the stomach in the upper left abdominal quadrant. And as we've said, we've got the islet of Langerhans, and these are all to do with um, the endocrine function. And within these islets, we have alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. Alpha cells secrete glucagon, beta cells secrete insulin, and delta cells secrete stomatostatin. So in terms of the insulin function, insulin promotes the conversion of glucose to glycogen, and we call this process glycogenesis. Therefore, if it's promoting glucose to glycogen, it must be inhibiting the opposite process. It must be inhibiting glycogen to glucose. And this process we call glycogenolysis. In other words, lysis breaking down glycogen for product that we're breaking down. So it inhibits glycogenolysis but promotes glycogenesis. Glycogen, remember, that's the form of glucose which we can store in the liver when we don't want all that glucose free in our blood. On the other hand, you get glucagon, which is released from the alpha cells. Glucagon does the opposite. It promotes the conversion of glycogen to glucose. In other words, it promotes the breakdown of glycogen. And therefore, it inhibits the storing of glucose as glycogen. So it inhibits glycogenesis. So again, remember, glycogen is the stored form of glucose. So coming to terms with these terms, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, is really important in understanding what glucagon and insulin do. So this summarizes it in a little table. So remember, insulin is all about stimulating the active transport of glucose and decreasing glucose levels. On the other hand, glucagon is all about stimulating the release of glucose by the liver, in other words, breaking down that glycogen. And actually, it's released during feelings of starvation when we have very low glucose and it's released in order to increase the blood glucose levels. The pancreas anatomy is really quite interesting because you can see this main pancreatic duct which runs down the centre here, and it runs all the way down to the ampulla vata where it meets with the common bile duct which is coming down from the hepatobiliary system up here. This is more of a GI exocrine function where it releases the pancreatic secretions and the bile into the duodenum. However, in terms of endocrine function, we can look at these pancreatic islets and you can see the alpha, beta and delta cells here in terms of the histology. Be aware as well, the pancreas, like we said before, it sits just behind the stomach in the left upper quadrant, but also be aware of it, the tail of the pancreas, so you have the head, the unsonate process, the body and the tail, and the tail tickles the spleen. And you can see the splenic artery running its torturous course here along the 
um, body of the pancreas towards the spleen before it branches out. So here we can link this into fat and adipose tissue. And adipose tissue can be brown or white. So brown adipose tissue transfers energy from food into heat. In other words, it does thermogenesis. It also co um, causes lipid utilization. And histologically, this is what brown adipose tissue looks like. On the other hand, you can have white adipose tissue. And this is for fuel storage and insulation. And this is what white adipose tissue looks like. As you can see, it takes up a lot more space histologically. Ghrelin and leptin are two confusing concepts, but actually they're not too difficult. Ghrelin is the appetite stimulator. It wants you to eat. It's released from the stomach, and it sends a signal to the brain to say, I'm hungry, I want food. And things like age, gender, blood glucose, and leptin levels can all affect the ghrelin levels in the body. On the other hand, you've got leptin, and this is our appetite suppressor. It stops us wanting to eat. So it's stored and secreted by fat cells, and after a meal, leptin releases uh, a signal to the brain that says, I'm full, stop eating. Leptin can be linked to weight gain, and this is an interesting cycle because wherever you start here, if you gain weight, the number of fat cells increase, and therefore so do leptin levels, and then you can develop leptin resistance, so as you increase fat stores and whole body inflammation, your body develops leptin resistance, and with this disrupted signal, it can cause overeating because the leptin is not expressed as it should be. The signal is not getting to the brain. And therefore you continue to eat through the release of ghrelin or simply through not releasing leptin. Increased calorie take then leads back to increased gain of weight. So it's almost like a vicious cycle. If you gain weight and then you lose the, the leptin ability to transmit the signal to the brain. In other words, you get leptin resistance. Another clinical, uh, another clinical aspect to be aware of are diabetes and Differentiating between type 1 and type 2 diabetes is really important. So type 1 is where your body cannot produce the insulin it needs. The cause of this is unknown, but it's believed to be as a result of the immune system attacking the insulin-producing cells, which we know are beta cells. The symptoms in this case often appear suddenly, and it's usually diagnosed in childhood or in young adults. But type 1 diabetes, all that being said, it is fairly easily treated in regards to taking insulin daily. On the other hand, type 2 diabetes is where your body has resistance to the insulin. It's more than capable of producing it, but it doesn't respond to it, or the insulin receptor doesn't work. Alternatively, your body could simply be producing too little insulin. The risk factors include advanced age, obesity, poor diet, family history, and physical inactivity. And the symptoms in this case, therefore, appear gradually. Type 2 is arguably preventable. With respect to if you keep a healthy diet, regular exercise, and maintain a normal body weight, it massively reduces your risk of type 2 diabetes occurring. However, type 1 diabetes, it's almost inevitable, inevitable if you're going to get it because it is an immune overreaction by destroying those insulin-producing cells. So that just brings in a little bit of a clinical context with regards to insulin and glucagon and their role um, when they're released from the pancreas. That's everything for part 2. Um, if you do have any feedback, please do let me know, um, and if you've got any questions again, please do get in touch. Um, part 3 will continue to co looking at some of the endocrine um, glands and organs uh, and their functions. Thank you for listening.